So the first color we're going to do is red. And to activate or wake up your paints, you just kind of rub that color. And now you've got a whole lot of color here in your palette. And you can bring it over here onto the palette tray if you've got one. And um, but what we want to do is we want to have enough color and not too much water. So you want to wipe your brush off then. So I'm not so much cleaning the brush as I am um, getting rid of all the extra water. So um, I have somebody that's just joined uh, joined us and I, that that could continue to happen. And um, so Darla, if, I think you can hear me if you, or anybody that's joined me has any questions, um, please you can put it into the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. So um, um, I'm and welcome. I'm really, really glad you're here. So now then I'm gonna load my brush with the red paint that I've put over on the tray. And I just kind of want to put that color down and fill in this area. I am not going to, I can put the color down and I can pull it out, but I don't want to go back and forth. When you go back and forth with your brush, you're treating that paintbrush as if it was a crayon instead of a paintbrush. And um, that's not what we do. So um, that's not the, the painting process that I teach. Um, I have to tell you all Monday night or Wednesday, uh, what night was it? Um, Wednesday night this week, I taught live in, um, in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Leander's Chamber invited me to teach um, a group of ladies. Um, and it's the, I don't remember, but it's just, it's just women in this group. Um, and um, I, um, I realize it's a fundraiser for the chamber. And I, I realize it's, it's all, you know, really, really good uh, fun. Um, but it's one of those things that, you know, they open a glass of wine and everybody paints. And so they have no intention of learning how to paint. And I don't really know. So I show up with the paint and I show up with the patterns and, um, and I start teaching. And one of them gets on the telephone and another one um, is sitting there just color, you know, drawing in the, in the outline and then filling in the color. And, um, and boy, do I ever have to spend all my time just biting my tongue. <laughs> And that just doesn't work. Uh, it's just so I'm just so glad that I teach on Zoom and I can't see anything you all are doing. <laughs> so do you all find that funny? Was that was that not very nice of me? <laughs> Some of you have painted with me enough to know. But um, anyway, I do enjoy Zoom because I get to know you all. Um, but it's, it's, I don't feel as responsible for everybody's end, re end result. And then when we hold it up and I see what a beautiful job everybody's done, I don't care how you painted it. I am just glad you're here and that we get to paint together. So now then I'm gonna take the orange and the only thing that I need orange is the tip of my brush. So I don't need to load it a lot over here. And now then I wanna make sure it doesn't have too much water again, but I'm gonna come right in here into the color. And all I'm gonna do is just lay this brush down on top of that beak. I'm not going to do a lot else, just kind of lay it down and, um, you know, color his beak there. So he's going to have a lot of uh, um, personality, I think, with his um, 
um, comb on his head and everything. It's really fun. The um, roosters I grew up with had um, more, I guess their comb and everything was a little more um, orange red. And if you want to, you know, you can come over here and you can mix your red and make it a little more orange. Or now then, now that we've got this orange here on our tray, we could mix the color on the paper instead of mixing the color on the palette. So I'm gonna come over here and you don't have to do this, but you can. I'm just gonna come over here and put that orange down on top of that red and you all can see it mixing right there on the paper. And that is just as much mixing your color as mixing it on the tray is. So, and when you do this, you kind of want to wait until the paint is dry that you've already put down, the red color is dry, because if you don't, the brush kind of acts like a sponge. And instead of laying that orange paint down, it picks up the color that was there that was wet before. So um, that's all part of painting that way. And, um, and it's, um, you know, but both of them are very much correct. And now then I'm gonna clean that, that red. I'm, a stickler for a clean palette. A couple of reasons. One is if um, I'm working on a custom painting for somebody and I let myself get a dirty palette, I promise you I make a mistake and stick my brush in the wrong color at one time or another. And boy, am I ever sorry if I go as far as to put that color down into the painting because um, nothing can ruin a fresh look faster than um, a color right in the middle of what you're doing that didn't belong there. So that's a good reason for a clean palette. And now then uh, what we want to do is we want to take that orange again and this time we're going to put it over on our tray and have a lot of uh, bright you know, real strong orange. And this color is uh, Daniel Smith's permanent orange. And what that means is it's the same. Um, it can be just as much the same um, um, as a wash as it is with lots of color. And it's real consistent. It doesn't have any particulates in it. It's not um, granulated. It um, is just real strong, good color orange. And um, so now then I want this to be a little bit of a wash. I want a little bit of water in it, but I want a lot of color. And I'm just gonna take it, I'm gonna put my brush down and I'm gonna bring it over here. I'm just following this back here just like that and I want even more color so I'm going to do it again and this time I've just got the tip of my brush and um, now I'm going to lay my brush down and um, so what I'm trying to do is give lots of color there for it to be picked up in just a minute when we bring in some yellow. And now I'm gonna clean my brush. And then if you all will look up just a second, you know, with, with that clean, with that brush with the orange on your, in your hand, if you'll look just a minute, I'm gonna get that yellow because I don't want this orange to dry. And I'm going to turn this painting so that I can really get in here 
and I'm pulling this orange color down. Now, some of it may really come down fast. Some of it may not. But the thing is, is that had this paint not been moist at all, I wouldn't have been able to pull any in. And the yellow continues to uh, soften that orange and it will continue to blend a little bit. So I'm showing you a lot of mixing the color on the painting today. And while you all are finishing both the yellow and the orange, I'm gonna clean my palette. So, um, Kathleen, can you hear me? I guess not. Kathleen, can you hear me? I I think she's frozen because I can hear you. Yeah, I was just I just wanted to tell her that um that my orange really dried fast, so um I had a hard time with getting it down. Thanks for letting me know that. Linda, I can't hear you. Well, I'm unmuted, so. I don't know, I, I can't. Um, I don't, um, thank you, Chris. Um, so Linda, do, is it me? Uh, let me see, maybe it's me. I think maybe it's me. Okay, now talk. No, here, now you're muted. How about that? Oh, now I can hear you, yes, thank you. Lord, the, Lord, the button issues. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to share that my, my orange really dried fast. Maybe I didn't put it down wet enough, but uh -huh. anyway, I just wanted to share that in case anybody else was having that issue. Well, you can see right here that mine did too. Yeah, okay. And, and that is just, but when you go, on top of it and pull it down a little bit at least it looks like it belongs there you know instead of separating them and yeah. um and to really you know like if we wanted if we were just real serious about it we could come back in here with this orange and and i'm just showing you all this um um the we could come back in here in this orange if we really really wanted it to blend real well so now then my orange that i got is pretty wet the yellow's dry the orange is dry and but now then i'm going to come in there right there with that little brush stroke and i'm going to clean my brush and now i'm going to go in there and moisten all of it and let it blend and oh. um so okay. that's, you know, if we really, if it really mattered um, about the blending part of it, and see now then I've got a lot less yellow, but it really stands out more right up next to the areas that I blended a little bit. 
but you do need to go in with a little more color when you do that. I mean, for instance, like we could have gone in with yellow and gone up into our orange more, and that would have done the same thing. You know, it's just all, what is it we're trying to do here? Well, we're trying to have some area that's a blend of both the yellow and the orange. And I think that's, uh, you know, great fun. And um, my rooster has a distinct white mark in between his head and uh, his body. And since the rooster I'm painting here is just gonna walk right off of this page. And because I went into his red a little bit with, um, with orange, and I've got this orange on my palette, I'm gonna come up here and I'm going to kind of try to blend some of that. Well, you know, it didn't really activate that red very much. So that red pigment must not be just real strong. So I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna do more. I don't want more than that because it's, you know, I don't want his, back to be a blend of, um, but you see how, and these are the things that are not just messing in your painting. These are the things that you can do with color that's just great fun. Um, and, you know, your paint in that area doesn't have to be dry. Um, the, you know, we, we're not gonna get back into that uh, for a while. So, um, um, you know, that can be just left like it is and we can go on to whatever. So if you did that, you're, you're not behind. Um, but how quickly you go back into the color, how much color is there, and of course, how much water and color is on your brush those are all of the things that matter. And that's why I teach that is, is so that you can begin to realize what just happened. Um, I've always thought it was kind of funny when uh, people call them happy accidents. Um, and, you know, really and truly, if you're wanting to be able to paint with control, you know, which is what you've got to do if you're going to make a dog look like a dog, if you're going to paint a pet painting for somebody. But you have to um, be able to figure out what just caused that, what just happened there. And so, you know, when you're blending and it doesn't blend right, you know, why was it? And thank you. Um, I guess Linda's actually away from her painting now, but uh, thank you, Linda, for asking that question and uh, or telling, you know, bringing that to my attention. Um, so um, now then I think everybody's probably caught up. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is purple. And if the purple blends with that yellow, it, um, um, you know, see the color it makes, that's not so bad. But I like a little bit of white to be left also. And so the pencil lines in here are pretty distinct. And um, if I keep some white space and I, you know, bring the, pur the purple right up close to it, nobody's gonna notice those, those pencil lines because the purple is gonna be bright enough that it's not gonna be the thing that gets the attention. Um, now you can always erase your pencil lines, but I can promise you if I go to a museum and I wanna look at watercolor paintings, I go look at that watercolor painting because I wanna be able to see, I wanna know if I can see the artist sketch underneath his painting. I love that. That's one of the things I love the most about watercolor paintings is that you can see the artist work there. And so I just, you know, just saying, you know, the 
pencil marks are not bad. They sometimes actually control the eye and that's okay. It's okay that it controls the eye. So now then I've got my purple over here on my palette and I want that purple uh, to have lots of color and I want it to have some water. Uh, I mean, I want it to be also a strong wash consistency. I don't want it standing in water. And since I want to make sure that it's not, the color I put over here is not standing in water, I'm going to dry that brush again. I didn't clean it. I just, um, I just uh, wiped it off so that I could got, get off some of the water. So now then I'm going to come in here and my main thing is to follow this line down here. And um, the brush is doing a lot of really, really nice um, um, dry brush and that's fine. You can leave it or you can go back in with your brush by just putting that brush down on top of it because all that dry brush needs is a little bit of water to activate more. And so um, there I am finished putting in the purple and um, I think I'm gonna put my brush down right there and create more of a connection there. And um, you all may notice this is a different purple. If you're painting with my palette, you may notice this is a different purple um, than I was using before. And that is because I really want to start using this color and learn about it um, right now. But it is, um, I think it's, I think it's called quinacridone, uh, quinacridone purple instead of carbazole violet. Carbazole violet is the other purple I have had, but this is um, quinacridone purple. So dry brush is, do you see those little dots right there in that? And I went in and kind of moistened my areas with a lot of the dry brush, but dry brush is really, really beautiful. I mean, you can put a field of white flowers if you could really control a brush and the dry brush. Um, a lot of artists paint landscapes just that way. And um, it's, um, um, it's, you know, they're beautiful paintings when you can walk up to a landscape and see the um, dry brush and how they used it or how they just left it there because it was something that they could build into their painting. I've got, um, I've, I've got a, about four or five um, little lesser a yellow finch that come to a feeder right outside my window here in my studio. But I also have a, a Carolina wren that doesn't come to the feeder, but just um, stays down in the leaves right below it. And oh my goodness, the difference in the color of those leaves in that Carolina wren will get the corner of my eye anytime. <laughs> just the little flicker going on out there. So I think we're ready for the next thing. I mean, yes. I really am a problem this morning and I'm sorry. I had to stop to get my son out the, cleaning up his grandmother's estate. But what were you saying about the dry brush? Because honestly, my brush is just almost very dry. And I heard you saying something about it. Just a second, Linda. <coughs> Not out of water. Why am I? Um, um, okay. Why is my brush so dry? Yes, brush so dry. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, the um, um, there we go. Okay, so 
the best thing to do when you have a brush that just continues to be dry <coughs> is to squeeze a little water out on your palette and see if that water is coming through the filter into your brush or is it squeezing out in one of these areas right here okay and the reason is is this can get clogged over time if you've sucked paint back in to the brush it it can get clogged with you know like particulates or or what any whatever you want to call it um but also brushes get old and and that's what happens too but i know your brush isn't old yeah so the best thing to do if you're just having trouble because you're maybe just using the tip of your brush see now look up at yeah. this yeah oh my if god you're just using the tip of your brush there's not going to be any water flow because it really takes putting that brush down to get the water flow do you see the difference yes ma'am uh-huh i got then, the i know you've got it under control but but it it'll happen again and if you're really working with just the tip of your brush most of the time for one reason or another you really want to paint that way if you'll put a little bit of paint water in your palette and get in the habit of coming over in your color that way oh okay yeah those are all habits that get started with the way you paint and i'm not a believer that one way is right and the other way is wrong when it comes to holding your brush um you know because i just i think people have habits i mean all the years of standing at at an easel i hold a brush like this and that's the way i was trained to hold the brush but when i sit down and do any watercolor painting i hold a brush like i do a pen and um and to get somebody to hold the brush like this because i can paint with watercolor like this just as much as i can like this but this is habit this is what how i pick up that brush over and over again and it's hard to change habits and enjoy what you're doing and if i was picking up an oil painting brush like this and putting it in there i'd have this whole part of my hand covered with oil and sure. you know it wouldn't take me long to say nope that's not the right way so that's why you hold your brush towards the end and you hold it like it's um well i don't know what is that what is what do you hold that way chris what would you say <laughs> the um but anyway the um the next thing that we're going to do is because we're going to paint we're going to finish a lot of this rooster just with the black lines i mean he's an animal and he's shaped that way and we will take advantage of that uh, at that stage so now then i want to clean this part of my palette because that's where i want my blue for his tail and um you know if this was um a real rooster that tail would be uh, blue black. I mean, it's a black that when it gets in the sunlight, it's the most beautiful blue. And um, it's a color a lot of birds have that look black, but if they get in the sunlight and it's just blue, blue, blue. So I'm gonna take my phthalo blue red shade, which is a dark, dark blue and it, it activates real fast and lots of pigment goes into your brush and it does not get very light even when it's a wash and so i want quite a bit of water in here because i don't want to spend all my time um, getting more color out of here i want to be able to get all my color out of the tray so i'm going to dry that brush come in here and Linda, you may not want to dry the brush completely every time if it if you're finding out that it's running dry. And I've got my brush really wet and with lots of color. And I want this to be these long, flowy, wiggly feathers. I want every bit of this. 
to be made up of that kind of action there. And I can come in here and I can give them some more um, activity out here at the edge if I want to. I can come in, but I wouldn't go in and fill in all of the blue. It's a lot more interesting if you have all that white space in there. When I was studying art, the instructor would say, don't get rid of your white space. Keep your white space. Watercolor paint, they put a white in, their, in your palettes when you buy the kits, but it's real chalky. You know, it's not something that you really want to use. And so the white of the paper is supposed to be what the white is in your painting. And so you want to keep some white space in your painting. And the white space up against the color, the watercolor paint really, really makes it more brilliant. It's where it's right up next to it, like right here where we closed in that gap on, on the rooster's head. That is a lot more dull than um, the color where it's right up next to the white space. So I'm gonna clean my brush now and um, I'm gonna really clean it good. Um, and, and we're gonna do his eye, just one dot. We're not gonna go color in a large area on that eye. We don't want the eye to get bigger and we're talking about just the pupil of the eye. And I want to keep some white space around, maybe not all the way around the pupil, but I don't want to fill in that whole area where I left it white. And if you don't have a lot of white space, don't worry about it if you fill it all in. But, um, this would be my preference is to put this brush down. So I'm going to pick, this is actually indigo. It's not black. It's just a deep, deep, dark blue. And um, here I'll show you that it is. So this is the color of indigo. And if you all can see, it's kind of the color of blue jeans. In fact, it probably is the color that they use for Levi um for that dark blue denim blue um they probably use the very same pigment that i have in my watercolor paint from daniel smith um and i really do uh, um so there we go chris um is that good? Is it still frozen? Hmm. Um, you don't see it? Hmm. Did, have I frozen to everybody else? I, you all, I can't hear you unless you unmute. I'm not frozen. This is Linda. Okay. I can see you. Okay. So, Chris, you're the one that can't? You can now? Okay. Do you have your setting on um, speaker? Oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, so um, what, what you do, ah, look, did you all see what I did? I had a loaded indigo brush and I put it into my phthalo blue. So um, Chris's, um, I am going to show the, the action on the tail again. So I've loaded the brush with the blue. I have lots of water, lots of blue, and I'm just doing that. And it's, you know, the dry brush is fine. I had a lot more color, so I didn't end up with a lot more dry brush. And I just stayed in there. And then I can come in here and I can add more tail feathers 
out here if I want to. So <clears throat> did you see that, Chris? Were you able to see that? Um, OK. Um, now then, I am going to close my um, and um, come in here and start with the indigo again. And I've got the tip of my brush. I just have the tip of my brush with that indigo. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to just put his eye right there. And so it's just up at the front of the, um, so I've left the white space kind of behind it and a little bit below. Okay, I think we're ready to let it completely dry and do the black lines. And so I need to clean my brush and this time I'm gonna be putting it up. So I'm gonna fill it with water before I put it up. And it's always good to do things like that when you're letting paintings dry because it just doesn't seem you can have a little more patience with the whole process if you're staying busy. Um, and, you know, if you just keep going back into a painting, trying to make it um, just perfect, um, it's that's one of the things that all you do is add more water and it just never dries. Um, so, uh, but I do think that this, since this is a sketch, it's always nice for you to have something in your hand that you really enjoy. I mean, I really enjoy writing with this pen in my journal. I like to do a lot of things with this pen. So that's why I picked it up and used it as an art pen once and just loved it. So I'm going to start up here in his comb. And I didn't just outline. And now I'm doing his eye. And again, I didn't just outline. I didn't just outline his beak either. And guess what? This black line takes over. That's what the eye sees. And so over here on his back, you don't want to try to outline all the way from here up to here. You want that to be a little more sketchy. And so broken lines will work. And he, he kind of has some ruffled feathers. And so it doesn't have to be just so-so. It can be a little bit, um, you know, a mark here and there and, you know, have fun with this. Don't, um, don't, just, um, don't just outline him, try to have fun with it. And I just, I love doing their toes. I just, I mean, that's, uh, roosters have big, huge feet. And um, it doesn't matter how big, how little a rooster is, if they step on you, it hurts. Because they've got toenails. Or, yes, you know what I mean. And um, 
you know, and I'm kind of scribbling in here, but that's okay. We've got a lot of white space that can take a lot of scribbling. And then sometimes I have gone in and, um, no, I don't see it yet, but I, I have over the years, there we go. There's one that I went into the color and did um, the lines. In fact, I think I'm gonna do that this time. Um, so I think this rest, rooster looks like he's kind of trying to get control of the whole situation. And I like him. And then I'm going to come in here and right in this area, I'm going to sign my name.